I've had over the years the opportunity um, to get to know her as well as observe her really being focused um, on the inequities that exist um, and really trying to make a difference not only in her community but the work that she has done at Howard. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, in addition to all of her efforts um, as a medonk, you know, as a community activist, um, and the list can go on, I think that it's also what has really been touching and important to note um, that she actually uh, then, unfortunately, has joined us in terms of being a thriver. Um, and although she's had her own journey, which I'm sure she will touch on at some particular point, she is still out there working hard to make a difference. And so without further ado, I'd like you to welcome Dr. Lori Wilson and sit back for an amazing talk at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. It's so wonderful being here. You know, I spend my days um, doing lots of, of interesting things. Um, I began wanting uh, to do this when I was seven, and I saw a TV show, and um, it was in, in um, rerun, but it was called MASH. And any of you guys who know MASH um, know that there was Hawkeye. And Hawkeye was the guy who could go in and he would save everybody. You know, he could do everything. He knew and could diagnose everything. And for me, as a seven year old um, in my part of the world, I'm from Portsmouth, Virginia, a small um, city in Tidewater, uh, Virginia, I thought, wow, isn't that amazing? That's who I want to be. And just as a little bit of background, I'm first generation. So I'm the first person to go to college in my family. I'm the first person to go to medical school. Thank you. Um, I am the first um, to, to be this person in my family. However, I'm not the last. Um, even though nobody else wants to be a surgeon like me, um, they do feel that they have opportunity and that they have uh, the ability, and that if I can do what I said I was gonna do at seven and actually do it, then they can be the chef, they can be the, the business owner, they can be all of these things that they foresee in their life. And I think that that's a very special thing. Um, so I am a clinician, I'm a researcher, I, I'm an advocate, especially for um, breast cancer and cancers. I have spent um, much of my uh, career um, figuring out what it is uh, to be uh, this particular surgeon um, in a world where only 3% of the surgeons look like me. Um, and practicing in a world that when I walk in the room, they're not quite sure what to think. But we get there. We always get there. Um, at uh, uh, 11 years ago, I was really very lucky. Um, I spent my, the beginning of my career, the first five years, running uh, surgical oncology at University of Connecticut. Oh. Uh, great opportunity. <laughs> Wonderful. I love it. I love it. Um, I lived in Farmington. It was the first time that I kind of lived in a place where there were wild animals that kind of walked through your yard. And, you know, it was kind of cool, um, but different. Uh, and then um, I got an opportunity to come back and really to serve what I passionately had trained for. And those are women who oftentimes are marginalized, set aside, not listened to, and not um, uh, very different than who I am. And one of the things that I saw um, about this was that they were oftentimes not listened to, and they were not um, part and parcel a part of the team. And I said, how can I do something different? How can I make this work um, for my patient population? And so 
I am going to be the educator that I have uh, spent so much of my life doing in the very beginning. And then I'm gonna give you some context. I'll give you my story and why it's so important to me. And at the end, we'll also talk about um, the questions that you have for me that hopefully can help to uh, balance uh, all that you've heard today. So as we begin, I have no disclosures. And hopefully you can uh, see this. The whole goal of our objectives really is to learn about cultural humility. Cultural humility, I spent about a year and a half with ACGME, and they are the accreditation body for the graduate medical education. So all of the, the um, professional uh, clinicians out there as they're going through their training, they have to be uh, in a program that is credentialed by this body. And one of the things that we, we spent a year and a half was um, developing this whole um, idea of how do we think about engaging our patients a little bit differently? How do we make sure that they are feeling as though they're heard? And what are the principles um, behind that? We want to understand and define health disparities. We really want to understand uh, the difference between cultural humility um, disparities and um, health equity. And we also want to um, have uh, some uh, improvement and enhancement in our work. How do we apply it and what are our expectations? And I love this, this slide because it is colorful, like I am, um, but it is also um, inclusive of all the things that when someone walks into my office and sits down in my exam room, they bring all these things with them. They bring their culture, their art, their attitudes, their beliefs, their language, their customs, their rituals, their behavior, their faith, their religion, their foods, all of these things, their art, their drama, their music, uh, their attitudes, they bring all of these things with them. And for me to be a better clinician, I need to know that. I need to hear that. I need to see it and I need to incorporate it. And so cultural humility came out of a, a, a group from a, two, two women, um, really Melanie uh, Turvalon and uh, Jan Murray um, uh, Garcia in the late 90s. And it was really a way of incorporating cult multiculturalism into the work as healthcare providers. So this is not new. This is a concept that's been around a long time. However, it's not something that uh, has been uh, honestly uh, practiced and incorporated into who we are. So cultural humility really is not a checklist. It's not trying to uh, develop uh, a new method of what we're doing. It's really just reorganizing the way that we do it. And so cultural humility is a process of self-reflection and discovery in order to build honest and trustworthy relationships. And that process of self-reflection is my responsibility as a clinician. I am here not to just dictate. My job is not to just roll out what we're going to do. My job is to be a partner. My job is to educate. My job <laughs> is to make sure that we have all of the most up-to-date, guideline-based information to make the best decision for yourself. Does that always mean that it's the decision that I would make? Probably in about five to 10% of my patients, it's not. However, if they're well-equipped, well-educated, and with all of the things that we talked about from what their culture is, what they bring to the room, what they bring to the table, if I am incorporating those things, then we can get to a place that is perfect for them. And so the three dim uh, dimensions of cultural humility is really lifelong learning and criti critical self-reflection. It's recognizing and challenging the power imbalances, because we know that there are. And then institutional accountability. Somebody has to make sure that these things are actually working and um, that if they're not working, that they're figuring out what to do next. And so we talked about that it's not just a new way of thought. It really is just reorganizing what we should be 
already doing for our patients. It's the curiosity, it's the compassion, it's the empathy, it's respect, and all of these things working together um, for cultural humility. And so for me, it had to start with where do we begin and what is probably one of the most difficult things to deal with. And this is to recognize that there's a challenge in power imbalances, that the provider as an expert and the patient and um, family as an expert are kind of, should be at uh, the same level. But what we know is that there are definitely power imbalances that makes um, it more difficult for some families, for some to integrate their thoughts, their beliefs into the practice of what should be their care plan. And so it's important for us to know about what are the things that are important in this. And we talk about compassion. It's a feeling of deep sympathy for another who is stricken by misfortune. When we know someone um, who has been hurt uh, by us or someone, something else, we ask how we might help. And when someone uh, recognizes we're hurt, we try to open uh, for dialogue. How is that different from empathy? Empathy really is the ability to understand and share those uh, feelings of another. A key skill in making sure we're able to do our best to understand. Uh, it might feel like uh, the walking in the person's shoes. And we really can guess, um, however, we really don't know without an open conversation. And so oftentimes, you know, as a, a patient, my journey started uh, nine years ago. And uh, it, it started with uh, an unusual diagnosis of breast cancer in both breasts. I had um, triple negative breast cancer in one breast, and I had an invasive lobular, which is pleomorphic, which is a sort of common diagnosis, but not quite so um, uh, common. And it being pleomorphic meant that it was probably more aggressive. And so I started with that diagnosis, but did not realize all the things that went along with that diagnosis. Um, of course, as a, a surgical oncologist, I knew the steps, I knew the guidelines, I knew how it was supposed to work, but did I really? Hmm. I did not know until I myself had to walk in that um, in those shoes and to understand that there is so much more to uh, cancer and the care and the process than I ever could have um, thought. I am a woman of God. I believe in spirituality and it's an important part of who I am and what I um, believe is essential in my day to day. Um, but it wasn't particularly important to many of uh, my colleagues and my um, and those that were part of my initial um, discussions. And so it's one of the things that has driven me. So empathy versus compassion. Um, has been an important uh, distinction uh, for me. And when we think about health disparities, um, health disparities um, really are defined as a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and environmental disadvantages. When we look at the group, we know that it limits our continued improvement. It increases the costs that go along with um, health care, and we know that uh, the outcomes are not as great when that happens. We know that health disparities are like the social determinants, and I'm sure you had a lot of discussions about the social determinants of health while you've been here, but it really is about the culture, about the socioeconomics, it's about access. It's about gender, it's about language, it's about geography, it's about religion. It's about so many things working together to be our potential best. And so the definitions that I want uh, you to take away uh, today is health equity versus health inequity. 
health equity ideal, everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential. And more pragmatically, no one should be disadvantaged for achieving this potential if it can be avoided. Health inequity, differences in health outcomes that are systematic, avoidable, and unjust. You can see that there's a difference in the ways that these are applied. Health equity is really more about the bigger um, picture in the application. And the health inequities are really about the structured uh, processes that add to um, these health uh, differences. And I'm hoping that we get to a time where we go from equality to liberation, where you can start at a different place, but you end up at the same uh, level of, of care and great outcome, that you don't have to have a boost to get to where you need to be, that what we do and the processes we have in place are going to make sure that wherever you start, that uh, you end up at the same place. We know that we have a long, long, long way to go before we get there. But I know that it is possible. Um, we know that many uh, fences uh, are, are in the way um, of inequity uh, when we talk about these things. All of these things contribute uh, to the inequities of, of care. And these inequities uh, are risk markers. Um, what are the key contributors to be um, observed? The differences of access to resources and opportunity the differential application of care practices, multi-level uh, individual com uh, community and state policy. I am so happy to hear that you all are focusing on all of these things because these isms are the things that are going to marginalize our, po our populations. Racism, sexism, heterosex, um, uh, sexism, ableism, sizeism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as we go through this, um, we can't forget implicit bias. Time and time again, we hear that the things that we don't quite know about ourselves can be problematic for the care of the patients that we take care of, that we're, we're charged to take care of. And so the typical strategies for building cultural responsiveness is really the cultural sensitivity, the awareness, the sensitivity, and realizing that there's a difference between cultural competency and humility. It's giving up that power imbalance, giving some of the power to the patient, their families, deep listening, and understanding that when they walk in your door that they have more than what uh, the uh, expectations are. And um, who are our students here? Fantastic, I love it. I'm glad to see you here. But oftentimes, how are you taught to begin? You're taught, what's the um, problem, right? The HPI, and you, you go through uh, the reasons why the patient is there. You go through you know, your review of systems and on and on. There's a structure to it, right? That may not be always how patients see their disease, how they hear what we have to say, and what they, they need. When I go into my patient's um, uh, room, I sit down and I say, tell me how you're doing today. Yes, we're going to get to that information about why you're here and what is important for you. Um, but what I know is that it really is about who the person is that's sitting across from me. It's not me getting through my checklist. It's not me getting through the time. You know that the attending is, or your, your um, uh, senior resident is asking you to do this and get through this and come out and present and do all of those amazing things that you're going to learn to do fluidly. However, your patients don't know that that is the, the thing that is the structure. What they want to know is, are you in it for me? Are you going to be that person that is going to share the responsibility of my next steps? Are you going to really holistically understand what I'm going through? 
And that's what, what this is all about. It's really not about um, changing things. It's really understanding that what we know and what we've um, uh, developed, yes, you'll have to learn it this way because you'll be tested on that way. But you'll need to know who the person is sitting across from you well. And you have to understand what their needs, their goals, and what they're trying to achieve not what you're trying to achieve, not what all of your needs are, not what your um, institution is telling you. And I know it's a hard way to practice because you do not get any bonus points for taking longer to see patients. <laughs> you do not get bonus points for sitting down and really trying to understand, especially in this moment of the pandemic where many people have been isolated and they have not seen their family and they've not been able to share in the usual expectation of, of communication. And so your ability to sit down and say, how are you doing? May be the only conversation that they've had all week long in person with someone who really wants to know how they're doing. I've had patients who have just broke down and said, you know, you're the first person that has cared to know what I'm going through. And this doesn't have to particularly be an active patient that is getting treatment. You know, we're seeing patients in surveillance. Everyone needs to know that you're in it for their best, uh, their, um, best outcome. And so for cultural competency, it's a little bit different. So cultural competency, you know, was what we sort of developed initially and we talked about um, cultural competency almost as a checklist. That if you knew that I was black, that you knew that everything about me, you know, because um, there are some things out there that culturally have been said over and over again about black patients, about white patients, about Hispanic patients, about Asian patients. Are they true? Maybe or maybe not. However, it is less about that checklist and more about delving in to know um, what that uh, patient brings um, along the capacity uh, to understand um, who we are and to really kind of throw away that um, thought that you can be a cultural expert. It's not really kind of how it works. Um, the goal is that everyone brings something different uh, to the table. They may have grown up differently. How, how do you know? Maybe I grew up on a, on a, um, a, a small, uh, uh, a group of, um, of people who grow their own uh, um, vegetables on a farm in an area that doesn't really get to communicate with other people outside of who I am and what I bring. And so it's important to know that cultural competency is kind of where we started but this is the normal sort of belief that the, we've learned something from cultural competency, but we need to, to do something different. And so what are the common missteps when we think about these things? It's that the practitioners really struggle addressing cultural conflict, so they oftentimes will not address it because it's easier. That culture is oftentimes an afterthought or not really considered, and culture has to be within the context of who they are. Um, community members are not included in the process. Family. There are so many uh, of us who family is everything. And not until I became a patient did it make uh, an impression on me when someone comes in and they're completely alone for every visit that they come to. Before that, I, I was a patient, that, that didn't, mean as much as when I got my diagnosis and I wanted all of my support. I wanted someone to help me listen. I needed someone to help me to understand what I had done wrong. We know that that's not the, the mindset that our patients should have, but it was the mindset that I had. 
I was like, here it is, I, this is what I do. What did I do wrong to get to this diagnosis? And so our assumptions are oftentimes are, are made, and, but it's important for us to really honor what it is that, that is true. We know that there have been things that have happened that we just have to kind of own up to. Um, patients understand that there are differences in the ways that patients have been treated in the past. It's important to acknowledge that. And so cultural humility is really about awareness. It's about owning our values and our beliefs. And it's about community values and beliefs and institutional values and beliefs. And one of the things that um, I think is so important is to understand that there is a comfort zone that we have. But where the magic happens is when we step outside of our comfort zone. And you have the opportunity to be a game changer. You have the opportunity to change the world in the way that we look at these things. And it just takes one person, one person to really push this agenda and to say, I need it to be this way, okay? Okay, so I, I, I know that we started a little bit late. I, this is the dry part. I know learning all of the nuts and bolts about it. Um, uh, but I, I do want to have time to really talk about the context of my um, experience and how it, it brought me to feeling that strongly that this is important. So practicing cultural humility is really about bringing um, people bringing their own experiences into the dialogue and the clinician understanding that that is equally as important as what um, they bring to the table with their um, amazing experience as a clinician. Um, beware of your body language. Beware and know um, and own what you, you don't know. That's hard for clinicians, some. Um, it's hard to say, you know, I'm not quite sure about that, but I will make sure that we know this together by the next time that we talk, or I will call you and I'll give you that information. We will get to this point. Um, I think I respect those clinicians much uh, greater than those that um, have every answer and maybe it's not quite the question that I asked. Uh, know when to ask for help in practicing cultural humility. Cultural humility is difficult. It's difficult to, to practice and to understand and to um, really ideally um, make sure that you're using um, the uh, uh, appropriate uh, approach. So make sure that from a student perspective, step back as a clinician. Um, we want to approach uh, the students and peers with openness. We want to promote um, uh, mutual empowerment, trust, and respect. Our goals are to encourage peer learning and to promote culture of collaboration and cooperation. But there has to be some accountability. And that occurs in the inst at the institutional level with the commitment to diversify and um, to equip us with an understanding of equity. Um, in the institution to have anti-discrimination policies that are written and incorporated into uh, the policies of the hospital. It should not only be on, in the exam room, but it should go all the way up to the C-suite. It should be equitable distribution of knowledge and tools and supportive learning environment and culturally um, that, uh, uh, and linguistically, we should make sure that our services are provided appropriately. And then the student-centered vision and mission statements. We have to understand that we don't know it all and that learning is the center of what we're uh, going to do. And that um, when I think about these things, the things that have been most helpful for me in this process, it's not been always easy and I have not always gotten it right. But every time I put my hand on the doorknob, I say, am I equipped to walk in this room and do what I need to do for this patient? Am I willing to hear what they have to say to me and can I be focused on them? Not worried about all of the things, the charts I have to do, and you know, I have these three meetings that I have to do, and my department chair says I have to do this. That has to be put aside. 
this patient deserves our full um, uh, ability to partner with them. And then accepting um, uh, help, support of family, support of community, um, making sure that uh, we are inviting, I know that with the pandemic, this has been hard, but coming up with ways to invite um, family, to invite um, uh, those into the room with the patient. It's not a panacea, it's a tool. We cannot make this happen um, without uh, there being some missteps, um, but the goal is uh, for us to engage, um, for us to have informed uh, uh, curiosity and to ask questions differently. Um, from my institution, um, that 18 months that I spent at ACGME has helped me work with my institution to talk about uh, the model and the principle of humility. How are we going to incorporate it into our institution? We develop partnerships with people uh, and groups who advocate for others in our institution. And then cultural humility, we realized, was a larger um, uh, than individuals and must be addressed systemically. And I'm very blessed to be in an institution that felt that that was important too. And so we engaged um, in change by making authentic relationships with those around us. We clarified the ask, we tapped into our uh, motivations and value co-design. And we also uh, had the courage to name the issues to really talk about the things we weren't good at. And ultimately, the key improvement design elements were really trying to accomplish the aims for our disparities, making sure that we knew that the change uh, and improvement had to have some measurement and that there had to be some accountability at all levels. And that, me that measurement really was stratifying um, our data for relevant social demographics. We knew that we were not gonna have data that was perfect from the start. And we really air, uh, aimed at narrowing equity gaps. And the design of our dashboard was a part of our regularly tracked um, information. So it's not a separate add-on, not a separate thing that we were trying to achieve. This was all a part of who we were. And so in conclusion, um, from the just the nuts and bolts, Cultural humility instead of competency. Education closes ethnic uh, disparity gaps. Being knowledgeable about others requires ongoing lifelong process of learning. That's hard. It's hard. Uh, Self-reflection and self-critique. And about, you know, in all honesty, the bottom line is respect. Respecting the people that we care for, knowing that it's important and to have this continuous process of involvement. So um, that being said, um, I think that from my standpoint, my life has been a myriad of amazing opportunities to turn me into the person I am. Um, I'm at Howard University Hospital and Cancer Center. Um, at Howard, I'm blessed with my dream job. I'm a cancer surgeon. As I said, I'm division chief of surgical oncology. I am uh, able to serve the diaspora of patients. I have really been given the opportunity to do things that are near and dear to my heart and to really direct the path of what uh, those things should look like. I honestly spend my day partnering with women to help them understand the word cancer. Um, that word cancer has become their new diagnosis. And what that diagnosis really means, what the treatment will do and how they can look toward their future in a real and relevant way. As partners, I must meet my patients where they are and take every opportunity to ground them in a shared di uh, diagnosis of breast cancer. I am able to affect changes in their lives and often um, their lives looked, look under-resourced and marginalized. I'm able to make a difference through grant funding from organizations directed uh, to making a difference in the lives of our patients reducing barriers, discovering new ways to treat, and managing breast cancer 
uh, and shining the light on causes for health disparities. That's my life. But when all is said and done, what statistics tell us is we must do more. So often our personal narratives give context to who we are. So here's my story. It's been nearly nine years, or actually a little over nine years, um, since I was diagnosed with breast cancer. My cancer journey began with 230,000 other women who were diagnosed with invasive breast cancer. 27,000 African American or black women who looked like me. As a patient and as many um, do after hearing the words, you have cancer, my family and I looked um, to give the journey purpose. So we shared our lives during treatment in the Ken Burns documentary, if you all remember, um, Cancer, the Emperor of All Maladies. I was actually the black patient in the breast um, uh, section of that documentary. It was our goal really to share the moments of our family's experience because we hadn't seen that um, outside of the hospital. It was outside of the office, outside of the infusion center. Uh, and these moments uh, that filled the gap between the office visits, uh, it was important for me to show that the diagnosis of cancer invades every crevice of your life and the life of your loved ones. I'm blessed to have a husband who is there, but I was also um, there with a year and a half son, year old son. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in both breasts, invasive lobular, as I told you, and a triple negative uh, infiltrating ductal. My treatment included chemotherapy, a double mastectomy, radiation, hormonal therapy, immunotherapy, the loss of my breast because of a huge infection that I am in, almost embarrassed to talk about, but it wasn't my fault. I told my doctor. I said, there's something that's wrong. And they said, we'll see you on Monday. <laughs> and at that time, you understand, you know, we talk about being advocates for ourselves, and we talk about it like it's easy to do. Um, it's not easy. And when you are oftentimes not well, I was septic. And I was expected to advocate for myself to say, no, 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 you have to see me today. But what did I say? I said, okay. And I went home and uh, ultimately um, I was admitted to the ICU. I spent time in the ICU and I lost my breast, my reconstructed breast. Um, and for me, it was a wake up call that everyone was not going to understand and hear me um, and want to, to know what was important for me. And I went through hormonal therapy, and yes, at the very beginning, I had 15 to 20 hot flashes per hour, and I worked through all of that. I know, I see the fan, I hear you, I see you, absolutely. And it was like fighting a silent uphill battle to adhere to my treatment regimen. But as a believer of evidence-based medicine, I looked for clinical trials to join. But what I found was that my unique bilateral breast cancer diagnosis was limiting and excluded me from all the clinical trials that were available. But I knew what, that, I, uh, that whatever I could contribute was essential because though I am disproportionately represented in the diagnosis as a black woman, I am underrepresented in clinical trials. And often it's because I'm not asked. And though making it through treatment was not easy, the most challenging part of the cancer battle for me was after treatment ended. What I realized as a surgeon and as a survivor, that there's still so much that we do not know uh, about cancer. Um, for me, it was a call to arms. I didn't believe it, but I, I understood it now. My patients needed me. They needed my voice. They needed my advocacy. Um, what we know is that there's still a gap in survival between black women and white women, and it can be a very different disease in black women. What we know is that quality access to breast cancer care is essential. It, is, it decreases but does not eliminate the disparities that we see in breast cancer outcomes, but it's a start. 
This tells me as a believer in evidence medicine that we must think outside of the current paradigms uh, to provide innovative ways to look at the challenges of breast cancer. We must give women the breast cancer, with breast cancer ways to enhance their understanding of their journey, their quality of life, and their experience during treatment and recovery. We must support those on the front lines and engage in the fight against cancer with a mission to educate, to advocate, and to support individuals in a culturally relevant way. Uh, so the question that many of us are here to unfold is, how do we make an impact? We must feel empowered to walk away from today's sessions and work together to affect change that will enhance the benefit of scientific advancement, as well as improve health literacy, clinical research participation, and survival rates. And more importantly, every one of those nearly 250,000 women who were, will be diagnosed um, with breast cancer uh, deserves equitable care that is guideline and evidence-based. Period. We together can impact health uh, through a collection of approaches that is rooted in innovation that promotes prevention, access to quality care, and new and relevant treatments. I want to share just one story because I think we're getting close to it being time. Um, I write everything down because. I'm worried that I may forget something with um, the concern of chemo brain. <laughs> I have spent my life in front of podiums. My highlight of my best moment was presenting in front of my most uh, difficult uh, faculty members from start to finish, giving all the data from memory. It took me the op gave me the opportunity to show that I belonged, that I owned it, and that I was here to stay. Um, there was a moment that was probably one of the most defining moments in this, and it was a moment in the operating room. It's a patient who had come to me who um, had a diagnosis, but she hadn't told anyone. She didn't feel comfortable enough to, to to tell anyone, but I could tell she was so, so incredibly anxious about the process. We were in the operating room, we were doing all the things. We had the team members, the students, the residents, the um, uh, me as the faculty team leader. And she said, could you all sing to me? And without a beat, the students in my room started to sing Amazing Grace to her. They gave her everything that she needed in that moment to go through with her surgery and then ultimately tell her family afterward. And she said, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being there for me. Thank you for giving me what I needed in the moment that I needed it. And on and on, there have been story after story when we clinically take care of the patients our best and we add that cultural humility piece, that magic happens. So we talked about what happens when you step outside your comfort zone, because it's not comfortable oftentimes trying to understand what someone else is trying to uh, accomplish. However, what I do know is that when we do that, we get care that people remember probably seven years later we get care that is going to be adherent. We get care that is going to be compliant. We get the outcomes that we're looking for. And so I know that the stories that, you know, the, the slides were dry, but this is my context. This is why cultural humility is so important to me. For that moment that that patient asked for us to give her something more than what she needed, she knew she needed. And we stepped in holistically and cared for not only the things that she needed clinically, but also for her soul. So thank you so much for this opportunity to share. Thank you for listening to um, my journey and my um,
the opportunity to listen a little bit more about cultural humility and how important it is for us to incorporate it into the next steps of our lives as clinicians and advocates, as um, those that are going to support the patients that are going to be depending on us to give them our best so they can be their best. So I will take questions, I'm, I believe. Um, we have a few moments for questions. Are there any questions? Thank you so much. That means so very much to me. You are the reason why I do this. Um, I know that you know it's difficult for me to admit that I need to use a backup. It's difficult for me to come up and tell my story about how I should know better than to say just okay when I knew that there was something that was incredibly wrong. But to tell stories that really define what cultural humility can be is an important enough thing for me to overcome that and to, to come and share this with you. And thank you for being such an open audience and such a safe space uh, to be able to do that. <laughs>